Um, okay, so good evening, everybody, and welcome. Welcome along tonight. Thank you very much for joining me for tonight's session or today, whether you're watching it in the morning, the afternoon or the evening um, session where we're going to be talking about exercising um, for hormones. Now, um, the way the format I've kind of done it is like presentation style. So I'll put that up in, in a little minute. Um, and yeah, some people would ask me some questions to cover. So I have done that for you. If you've got any questions throughout, then just let me know. You can either type them, but sometimes when I've got the presentation up, I can't see the question that's come up. So you might have to just unmute and ask ask a question. But if um, likewise, if you've got anything you want to ask afterwards, then then that is fine as well. So let's see if I can share screen and do we see this okay let me just minimize that a wee bit just so that i'm taking that out of there and louise can you um unmute and tell me if you can see that if that's all right yeah perfect if anyone doesn't then just unmute and tell me because i see that sometimes the chat doesn't actually come up so um yeah this is us exercising for hormones um and my name is pam so i wanted to say thank you first of all for joining me tonight whether you are joining me live or whether you're watching the recording that's the beauty of all this online stuff is that i can record it and you can watch it at your leisure um i have had questions from some of you so hopefully i'll give you an answer that you find quite satisfactory but if not then just maybe i've picked up there was a couple of questions i was like mm, i'm not quite sure if that's what they mean but if not then you can you can let me know and i'm hoping to keep it to an hour or less than that um as I say, people who have done this type of stuff with me before know that I try and get as much information as I can. So I've, I've tried tried my very best tonight. Um, just a wee reminder that all the information that I'll give you today is kind of just to expand your knowledge really and use the information to help you because knowledge can go a long way. So just having a little bit more insight into things. I'm not a, a doctor. Um, so if you are asking about any specific conditions or medications, then I probably won't be able to advise on that specifically. Um, I'll probably just advise you to go back to speak to your GP or your pharmacist about it. But if you do have anything specific about that you want to ask, then then ask me, but I won't give you out information that I'm not qualified to, to give you. Okay. Um, so I am Pam. This is a nice picture of me in my 40th. It was the nicest one I could find because um, normally I'm like this with my hair back. I have been teaching group exercise, so fitness classes for 21 years. I um, also worked as a personal trainer, uh, group fitness trainer so um other instructors in the gym i would train them on how to teach classes a personal trainer sorry i said personal trainer a, a gym manager and um, worked abroad worked as a, a nutritionist with a professional rugby team and there's there's a lot of things going on in the last 21 years but i just wanted to give you a wee insight as to who i was and what my background is so i've got a an honors degree in, in nutrition lots of um, courses, qualifications with regards to fitness, and I've kind of specialised in women's um, wellness for the last few years, pregnancy, postnatal and hormonal change, and um, because that's just an area that I just, I think women just need as much info as they can to to make them, make these stages in life a wee bit easier as well. So today what we're going to discuss is um, basically from about the age of 35 now this can this this can vary it can kind of be from about age 32 and it could be a little bit um a little bit older as well but as women our body's requirements for exercise change as a result of the hormonal changes that we're going through so estrogen levels start to lower and um, cortisol or stress hormones start to increase and they can have an effect on the body so what causes that and how can we adapt our current regime or how can we embark on a regime to help to benefit us more, more in a, a sort of health perspective? And um, what considerations should we take into account when we're planning out an exercise regime for the perimenopause stage throughout menopause or in that postmenopause stage of life? And how can we adapt around our menstrual cycle to reduce our um, premenstrual sym symptoms and um, get gains from our workout? So, once I started actually doing this section, I, I kind of thought I should have just done it as a full separate um, workshop, to be honest, but I, I said I would do it. So I, I have inc included it, but there was so much more detail I wanted to put into it, but I thought I didn't want to have you here all night. So that's basically what we're going to discuss today. 
Um, please ask any questions as we go through and um, I've planned a couple of any questions that you've got to ask as well but just unmute yourself and ask if you want to. Uh, I tried to keep it as detailed as possible but also brief. I know that's a bit kind of contradictory. Um, there is a lot of information to fit in so it's not my strongest point to, to give you less. I normally always give you more. Um, and I wanted also to point out that when we're going through hormonal change, um, exercise is only one aspect of the things that we can do to help our bodies adapt to that. So lots of other considerations like nutrition, which I'm going to be doing a, a nutrition one for you as well, um, sleeping patterns, um, exercise, obviously, because we're covering that today, lots of other aspects that you can that you need to take into consideration. So it's not just the exercise that's going to make the difference. Unfortunately, as we get older, um, we do need to consider a lot of other things. It's not just as simple as, oh, just up my exercise or get to the gym a little bit more often as we maybe could do when we were in our 20s. Um, so it does take a wee bit more um, effort as well. So I think looking at this as a positive, these hormonal changes that we're going through as opposed to a negative thing, because when you say to people about menopause, um, they just think, oh God, it's going to be terrible and blah, 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 this, this, that, and the, all the, the, the symptoms. But if you try and think of it as a, uh, um, more of a positive thing as an opportunity to improve your lifestyle, your general habits and your overall health, just to make it a more positive thing. As soon as you start to put a more positive thought on things that, that are kind of initially feel negative to you, it can really change your experience of it. So try to, um, I think trying to do that could be, could be helpful. So I just wanted to go through perimenopause, menopause and postmenopause and what those stages actually are. Perimenopause is the time period that leads up to the menopause. So certain hormonal levels decrease, and specifically estrogen. We experience irregularities in our menstrual cycle. So they just change. They maybe last a bit longer or they're shorter. Your um, flow could be heavier or lighter, um, or they could be more or more frequent or less frequent. It's not as sort of like, it's not as regimented as what it was before. If you did have that sort of, yep, bang on the day. Um, is day one for me it might not it might not be like that uh, we start to feel these changes physically uh, physiologically and mentally and i'll be going through that a wee bit more detail as well due to these hormonal changes mainly because estrogen has over 400 functions in the body and that's why we get so many um the the sort of the symptoms of menopause are huge because of the so many functions of estrogen in the body so it's not like something like if you've got low iron levels you'll you'll feel a wee bit tired um because iron has a lot of functions in the body and one of the one of the most common is tiredness breathlessness um, and lack of energy but the lack the reduction of estrogen because estrogen's function in the body is so vast that we have all of these things that that can go on um, and that can last anywhere from a few months uh, up to about 15 years. So these, that's why I say from the age 35, because these, these symptoms can all start at, at, that, um, at that point in life. So that's what the perimenopause stage is. The menopause is actually the day or that point that you've had 12 consecutive months without having a menstrual cycle. It's not what um, we think of is that the menopause is all these symptoms, but that's actually like the technically textbook version. That's actually the, still the perimenopause. It's just when it gets closer to the actual when when you start to get that maybe not in a period for two or three months, and then one, and then and then it maybe like a longer bleed or whatever. The it, it, the symptoms kind of ramp up, and you're getting much closer to that sort of menopausal stage. Um, but menopause is actually just that point in time where you've not had a period for 12 months. We don't have any reproductive function as a result of the hormonal changes and our periods stop um, again as a result of the hormonal changes. Average age in the UK is 51, but it can occur earlier and it can occur later. Early menopause is the sort of um, the, the um, what's it called? The term, sorry, given to um, if you start your menopause, if you hit menopause under the age of 45, that's early menopause. Premature menopause is under the age of 40. Um, and postmenopause is basically that point in time where you have, that's you in the menopause, where you've had the menopause, that's basically the years afterwards. So if, you, if you're, say, 53 and you've not had a period for 12 months, menopause, and then after that is your uh, postmenopause stage. Okay. 
Um, let me just do this just a wee second. That's okay. I was just checking in case anybody was trying to come in. Um, so I'm going to go through what I said about the physical changes, the physiological changes, and the um, sort of cognitive changes. So the physical changes that we that we that we go through, uh, and and I've kept this small there's a lot more than this but i just wanted to kind of keep it specifically to what i get asked a lot so a lot of it is about women's body shape changing about um body weight increasing and stuff like that as well so i wanted to to keep it kind of um specific to that because just that's what that's the questions that i tend to be asked but there is a lot of more physical um symptoms than this that goes on in the menopause so basically your your body composition your body composition is the sort of ratio of a lean mass to fat mass in the body. So that changes um, over time. And what happens is that your muscle mass or your lean mass, that is the metabolic tissue in our body. So the more muscle you have, the higher your metabolic rate is going to be. So when that starts to lower, the metabolic tissue starts to lower. And that happens from the early 30s. As a result of that, our metabolism also lowers. So quite often we could be say 37 38 your muscle mass is is starting to decline but you don't you're not physically aware of that but you're generally keeping the same habits you're eating the same you're not really realizing but you're noticing maybe that you're putting on weight even though you're still eating the same and you're exercising the same so if you're still eating the same your metabolic rate is going to be starting to lower to slow down so if you're eating the same then that means that you're taking in excess calories because your calorie count would have to lower also to work along with that metabolic change if that makes sense and um, that's how we can result in in weight gain also the exercise habits that we have might not be um boosting that lean mass and that metabolism enough to to kind of counteract the the decline in it so due to the loss in the muscle mass and collagen um, we appear to be less toned as well we generally lose um strength mobility and flexibility which can result in an increase in injury and pain. So you might find that all of a sudden you start to get these kind of aches and pains and tweaks. You wake up in the morning a little bit stiff and sore as well. And that that can have a lot to do with the with the collagen um, and the la lack of muscle mass and the mobility and stuff as well. Lower back pain is um, very high. This was studies in, um, in Ireland. The women that I do quite a lot of training with is a woman called uh, Michelle Lyons. She's a very, very uh, renowned women's health physio uh, and she's Irish and a lot of her stats come from Ireland uh, from, from the courses that I do. So this was um, one over there that lower back pain is very highly reported in women aged 45 to 60. And as well as in that age group, you also see an increase as oste in osteoarthritis, increase the disc narrowing in the postmenopause stage and lumbar disc degeneration. So that can account for a lot of back pain and stiffness. Um, increased breast size as well. So as a result of maybe putting weight on, we maybe increase our boob size as well. And that can be a factor in the back pain. And quite often, even if your boobs are are getting big, you don't really think that much about it. And we're not wearing the same, we're not wearing the, the a right, a proper fitted um bra for that as well so making sure that you're obviously i don't really think we can do that at the moment um through covid and all that but um getting your your um your bra measurement is is kind of often as you can i think it's is it every sort of 12 months it's maybe um recommended i can't i can't remember off the top of my head but that can impact lower back pain as well and um interestingly it can also be linked to frozen shoulder and it can be um, linked to trunk rotation so that increase in breast size can can be linked to them also so how can we change how can we try to counteract that physical that physical change that that we're seeing as i say there's a lot more physical changes than that but what i'm thinking about is the whole the metabolism basically and i want you to think about how we can then start to increase our metabolic rate so the first way is um exercise obviously that would be using weights um resistant bands and body weight exercises uh, these are really vital to do because they're what boosts the metabolic tissue and the metabolic tissue being the lean mass is what increases the metabolic rate increases the amount of calories burned as well so i would say either doing a short sort of 15 minute session four to five times out of the week 15 minutes isn't that much so trying to do a little bit like that 
or if you can do longer session like 30 to 40 odd minutes doing three to four of them throughout the week as well so increasing that muscle mass and this is something that you see over a period of time you see the you see the change it's not going to happen in a week it's probably not going to happen in three or four weeks but if you consistently stick to it you'll start to see changes maybe 8 10 12 14 weeks down the line you'll feel like that your um that your metabolism is going to be faster your um, body shape is also going to be changing and you'll generally feel stronger it'll add shape and tone to your muscles improving your overall strength and reduce injury risk so i, I run a, a course called lift lean and it's a three week or four week sorry um weights based workout and one of the girls in particular has a lot of issues with her shoulder and uh, her wrist as well now since starting this in august last year so this is um may she has no issues with her wrist whatsoever it was like repetitive strain that she had from work and she has no issues with her wrist at all since doing the weights now at the start we had to adapt a lot of exercises because of um because she, she just couldn't take the, the weight in her wrist and stuff but she still has shoulder issues but it kind of flares up every so often and then it dies down again and it's not as consistent as what it was and she definitely believes that doing the the weights has has had an effect on that as well so it can um it can reduce that that pain and injury risk as well i would also say that incorporating more restorative type workouts in your weekly regime is vital because it allows your body to recover so as we age our body takes longer to recover so um if you've done a workout say on a monday and you want to do a workout on a tuesday but the two of them are quite high in, high intensity then you just think right well i need to work either different muscle groups or i need to use a rest day as well and when i say a rest day it doesn't mean that you you don't you don't do anything you can do something more restorative like yoga pilates um a more sort of lighter um workout using body weight or bands something like that so that you're because your recovery from your exercise has is just as important as doing the exercise itself even more so as we age so we do need we do need to have that time where we where we restore um this also has a much more positive impact on your brain function which i'll talk about this in a wee minute as well and your stress release which again i'm going to talk about stress and um hormones as well so um a combination of doing some weight exercises that could be weights resistance bands or body weight exercises um, is very important as well as adding in the restore workout so say for example you work out five times per week having maybe two sessions of them where they're more restorative and that i mean you can still work so when i do um some of my classes i do like a bar class which is a ballet base it's very much conditioning um, and a certain some of the bar classes not all of them i would say that's more of a recovery workout but you still really feel the body working you still feel you're getting a really good stretch it's not like you're it's not like you're not doing anything kind of thing so um this can be quite difficult if you are used to working out five times a week or four times a week you're like i need to make my workouts count i think a lot of the things a lot of girls come around and say to me i just feel that every time i do a workout i need to make sure i'm sweating i need to make sure that i'm burning and actually you don't have to do that you all your body really does need to have that that um recovery session as well and it'll you'll find that having more recovery will let your your body progress much further in what you're doing as well so if that's running or cycling or or high intensity interval training things like that having implementing at least one day of restorative stuff then your body will progress a lot quicker. So hopefully that makes sense. The things that we come up against, the phys physical changes, and then how we can implement a bit of change towards that. So the next one is your physiological changes. So your physiological changes are more um, sort of the internal workings of the body, the digestive system, um, the respiratory system, skeletal system, nervous system, and muscular system. So what happens to our physiological um side of the body and again this is just stuff specific to the regular questions that i get asked there is a lot more that goes on but i've only got well i'm wanting to keep this under an hour so we can't we can't go too too much into it um so one of the main thing is that your bones so your bone strength your bone density you um starts to reduce so you want your bones to be nice and strong when they become a wee bit more brittle they can break easily and quite often you would maybe 
um, have a breakage and then you would go to hospital and they would be like, oh, you've got like, early onset osteoporosis or and you'd be like, oh, right, OK. And you've got no idea until you actually break something that that's happening. So we want to try to make sure that we are building our bones and they're being really strong. And um, as a result of the, the bones changing, uh, we can get shorter in height. We can develop this sort of hunch and uh, the trunk and the spine basically shortens and that can account again for a lot of the joint pain and stiffness that comes with age so keeping that keeping that in mind increased stress levels can result in increase in blood pressure high cholesterol levels increased risk of stroke and stuff as well so um, that stress hormone that cortisol we want to try to be keeping that um as low as we can and I think as we do age, we definitely feel an increase in that because we've got more pressure. So if you think about the the kind of, I say, I've said this before to a lot, a lot of my girls, like all the, in your 20s, what you used to do then, and then maybe 30s, late 30s, 40s, you've then got a mortgage, you've got family commitments, and um, you've got maybe a, a higher up job, so you've got pressures of job. You've also got the pressure of social pressures, like social media. Um, I'm this age and I'm, I'm this, so I should look and act a certain way. Um, so we, and we also feel a lot of pressure like that. So increase maybe anxiety, low moods and stuff as well. And that stress has an impact on our overall health. So it can result in increased blood pressure, high cholesterol, it can be high sugar levels. Um, lots and lots of impact from, from cortisol as well. Heart disease is the number one killer of women in many countries. This one was, um, again, a study in Ireland. And this study, there was a couple of studies actually that, that came to the same conclusion that 90% of heart disease strokes are lifestyle related and they can be avoidable with lifestyle changes. So a lot of these things that if we implemented just a few lifestyle hacks or a few lifestyle changes and it is maybe just being a wee bit more mobile um could reduce your um risk of developing these and these are very much in that post menopause period as a result of that estrogen change then um your likelihood of having these um conditions post menopause is much higher so trying to keep that in mind and you're doing all this type of stuff for your overall health in that post menopause you're doing it as a preventative measure um yeah as opposed to sort of um wait until something happens and then prevention is better than cure that's the that's the phrase i was thinking of um sleep as well is often affected through um hormonal change and that has a total knock-on effect to everything in our body absolutely everything i've put down recovering from exercise illness and just generally restoring energy levels but it has an impact on everything your food cravings your blood sugar levels your moods your your outlook and, and your um concentration levels it has an impact on everything you know that 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 sleep is just when you get a good night's sleep you think oh i feel great after that and that's something we should try try to strive to get as as often as possible um because having good sleep can can have such a positive impact in the body so that's some some things that happen physiologically to us. And then how can we change this as well? So you'll see similarities here that for the physical changes with the metabolism and the lean mass, how can we change the, the increase? How can we boost our bone density? Also the weights, the resistance and the body weight exercises can help to strengthen bones and delay that onset of osteoporosis. So there you go. You start doing some weights, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, each each day or maybe a wee bit longer every alternate day or so and that's you've got two birds with one stone you're you're boosting the metabolism you're also building your bone density as well as toning and shaping your your muscles if body shape is important to you then that's that's three things that you're basically getting from that one thing and this will happen a lot like the exercise will have a uh, positive effects on a lot of things in the body so focusing on them um, postural work and and then um, specifically working on mobility work uh, back pain and uh, sorry back kind of postural work will have an effect on your mobility and your back pain and that shortening of the trunk and the spine so this movement here that rotation the trunk rotation is one of the first movements that we can lose with age along with ankle flexion and foot foot uh, mobility um, and if we do this type of stuff then that's going to that's going to kind of reduce the the likelihood of us losing that movement so again all these things if you don't 
use these movements then we start to lose them as we age so focusing on postural work and that could very much be a restorative session if you were planning one of them through the week then doing like a mobility class or something that focuses a bit more on on posture work using movement to reduce your stress it can help not scan help can help with your blood pressure your cholesterol and your heart disease and when i say movement um moving your body doesn't necessarily have to be a full-on workout it can be a stretch session it can be getting out for a walk um, it can be um playing a game in the garden it's just moving your body moving moving your body as much as um scheduled exercise that that um challenges your body has many benefits you'll get a lot more benefits if you include that but just if you're not doing any type of exercise at all then i would definitely say just focusing on moving your body as much as you can if you're sitting at your desk working a lot of the time get up every 30 minutes or so or even when you're sitting at your desk try and add some some movement so that you're moving the body and they all these little things have an impact on your blood pressure cholesterol and heart disease as well establishing a consistent bedtime routine will help your body recover because in that sleep period that's when our body um restores and recovers from all the kind of pressure that we put on it all the stuff that we ask it to do through the day it needs that time to restore so if you're not in a good sleeping habit um if you struggle to get to sleep at night or you wake up feeling that you're just still a bit kind of drained then trying to get a good consistent bedtime routine can really help with that and i will stress that that doesn't happen overnight so last night my husband andy went to bed quite early so he's always up later than me but he came to bed at the same time as me last night which is not not very common and um he woke up really early tonight and then today he says i mean what was the point of me going to my bed early i woke up much earlier today and I, i'm not be doing that again and i says yeah but it takes time for that to happen if you want to get to your bed earlier so you get a longer sleep because he'll maybe have like five or six hours sleep and always moans about it <laughs> i say to him oh, you need to stick with that you need to get to the, the, the get to your bed the same time most nights so it's consistent it doesn't have to be perfect so there'll be a couple of nights you don't do that but being consistent with what you do before you go to your bed and the timings as well can have a can have a huge impact that can help your body restore it can help your body de-stress it can boost your immunity helps your recovery and helps your general menopausal symptoms because again just letting your body rest and recover can help your um if you're having other menopausal symptoms your rest time allows you to achieve gains from your workouts so as i say when you're having that recovery day or rest day you might still be doing something as in like a pilates or yoga or something like that but doing that can really let your body when you are then doing your your running or or whatever it is that you're doing you'll see that you will progress because you're giving your body that wee bit extra tlc your body will thank you for it it's quite it's, it's, it's screaming out for it so hopefully that makes sense about the physiological changes about the bone density about the increase in heart disease and um, the reduced reduction in the 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 um sort of the spine becoming a wee bit more compressed and sleep as well and those are just the ways that we can work through that to 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 help kind of counteract the the negatives of them basically i relate very much so to this lady here i love her face because i'm like oh I, that, that's what i see in the mirror quite a lot <laughs> Um, cognitive changes which is kind of ma your main mental changes i wanted to just again keep this quite precise um just from again feedback from the girls that i work with what they tend to feel and um yeah just just notice that from there but there is a lot more that that goes on mentally as well so at this time women also feel quite overwhelmed anxious depressed they have brain fog forgetfulness difficulty in concentrating increased stress stress levels and low mood and the kind of worry or the stress about menopausal symptoms exacerbates your menopausal symptoms so if you're like oh my god am i going to have a hot flush am i going to have a hot flush that response is you're kind of stressing about it and that that will kind of almost guarantee that it's going to happen so trying to to um to change that kind of mindset think about the positives keeps you warm think about the positives and trying to spin it around a wee bit and think about there may be things that are causing that hot flush so one of the girls that does my um lift lean um group she and um she comes in and she was saying that she would get a terrible hot flush like i think it was about half 10 11 o'clock at night so what she done was she completely cut out her caffeine 
and I think she used to have like a cup of tea and a biscuit about like seven, eight o'clock. And then like a couple of hours later, you wouldn't think it would have that effect. But when she stopped doing that, she stopped getting the hot flush. There could be something that's, if you're getting the same sort of symptom quite regularly throughout the day, it could be something that, that, that you, that you are doing that's maybe causing that to happen as well. So it's not necessarily what's happened at that specific time it could be an hour or two beforehand as well things like caffeine things like sugar um as well can have that impact so having a look to see what's going on around your around that time can can make a difference as well um so yeah stress is a major factor in a lot of hormonal um and menopausal symptoms as well um trying to manage your stress response to things so if you know that there's going to be a stressful situation coming up think about it beforehand and convince yourself it's going to be okay think positively about it and um sorry i just thought somebody was trying to come in there uh think positively about it try to switch it around to say well i'm going to do this to try and combat it some deep breathing a wee bit of mindfulness or or getting yourself out into fresh air just having a glass of water and taking a wee minute just to think 20 30 seconds just to think can can make a difference as well so the stress response is really important and um, cognitively or mentally, that dementia and Alzheimer's again. This was um, this was a study uh, in Ireland, um, as is more prevalent in women than men. And in Ireland, um, there was just under twenty thousand men, and over thirty, almost thirty six thousand women that had that was Alzheimer's specifically. That one, I'm sure, um, and it it has such a much more effect. Such a much that doesn't make sense. Uh, a much more effect on women. Than what it does, the more it does men. Now, I've I've, I've been kind of looking for a lot. A lot of my work is all based on evidence base. It's all based on studies that have come out as well. And I was kind of I didn't have time wise. I just I didn't have time to read through a couple of the the um the studies I wanted to 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 that were that were speaking about women and, and kind of Alzheimer's and dementia as well and that sort of hormonal impact on it. So I didn't really get to to look through that as much as I wanted to, but I definitely will and I can update on on that as well. So that's the that's the type of things that happen to us mentally. Obviously there is there is a lot more. Um but again trying to keep it precise time wise and how can we change this? So movement again helps de-stress. So if you think about the movement is going to help with the physical changes movement is going to help with the physiological changes and movement is going to help with the cognitive changes so that's movement exercise just getting up off your butt basically is going to help all those aspects so one thing doing one thing can help those three things as well um having a hobby or creating a new hobby it's a good time so it is a time of change so if there's always something if you want if you've always wanted to do tap dancing classes or you've always wanted to start rollerblading or play tennis try it just just get in just get in and do it because there's a time of change so say this is a time of change i'm going to do something that i've always wanted to do and it becomes a new hobby and when you enjoy it you'll spend um the the time the sorry having a hobby or spending time moving your body will adjust your mindset so if you're doing something new you're having to kind of like put on your learning head again and it can help you focus and reset because you're using a, t a side of a part of your brain that you've not really been using as much when you're out doing sort of physical like learning to rollerblade um or that it's, it's a part of your brain that's probably like been a bit quiet because you've not you've not used it a lot so that can just that can completely change things around give you a bit more focus and and kind of reset the reset your your energy levels and your passion for something as well um it boosts your uh, circulation movement boosts your circulation so you can increase your your energy levels and um, more restorative based classes are very very much mind and body connected so um some people think it sounds a bit sort of out there with the whole mind and body connection but if you do an exercise in say for example one of my classes we would do squats and then I'd done a class called Brain Fit, which was you do your squats, but you really think about the part of the body that's moving. When you connect your mind to your muscle, first of all, it burns a lot more. You feel it a lot more, but it also, everything else goes out of your mind. 
So when you're doing, if I'm telling you to do 20 seconds of squats, you're doing your 20 seconds of squats, but you might also be thinking about, right, I need to go shopping, I need to do this, I need to tick off that in my to-do list, I need to blah, blah, blah. Whereas if you're doing something that's a bit more slow and controlled, it allows you to get that mind and body connection so that everything else, you are getting away from everything else that's going on. And I think we need that because we've got a lot of stress in our daily life. And the more we can take a step back from that, the better the better for our overall wellness. And these mind and body classes are, um, are the restorative is, is much more effective to let the brain switch off as well. Brain training exercises like your Sudoku, like your um, crosswords and stuff like that. Also things like, so when I, um, when I make up my classes, I do balance work, I twist across and just by bringing, this is something that you may not think about, but bringing the hand across the body fires off nerve impulses um, and it trains the brain when you're standing on one leg that trains the brain brushing your teeth with your if you're right-handed with your left hand trains the brain or brushing your teeth with your right hand if you're right-handed and standing on one foot little things like that gets the brain gets the brain working as well and trying to implement things like that can change it so again hopefully that helps thinking about the co some cognitive changes we can go through and i'm sure some of us can relate to them so we've got the kind of the feeling of being overwhelmed, uh, feeling quite anxious, feeling depressed, having brain fog, like why are my keys in the fridge? Um, or like you just can't get words out, being quite forgetful, having like you're in a meeting at work maybe and you're like, you just can't concentrate on it. Um, your stress levels increase and your mood can get low as well. So I'm sure that you could probably pick a few out of there that you can relate to. And hopefully these things here can all have a knock on effect. Plus a lot of these things here have a knock on effect to the physical and the physiological side as well. So you're kind of getting a lot. You're getting a lot for your for that one thing, basically. Um, so overall, how moving your body benefits your hormonal changes. So these were the ones that I, I kind of thought about off the top of my head. I'm sure there is there is definitely more here, but these were the ones I thought, right, that's a good list and it's easy enough to read. So you boost metabolism to combat your weight gain because boosting the metabolism increases the number of calories you're going to burn when you're just resting. So if you're exercising, you're burning more. So you can lose weight quicker when you when you boost that metabolism. Changing your body shape. So for people who do want to change the shape of their body, then exercise can help with that. Strengthening your bones, which again, that osteoporosis and stuff we spoke about. Reducing your stress levels, and I put vital because that's very that's very much so one of the vital things that we need to that we need to focus on as well. Reducing anxiety and helping with your moods. If you've got mood swings or you feel quite low at times, it can help with that. Improving your sleep quality, because you're burning off energy basically. Um, reducing general menopausal symptoms as well, hot flushes, um, the stress, the all the the kind of cognitive things as well. Uh, reducing your risk of heart disease, strokes, blood pressure, high cholesterol and insulin resistance, which is where your cells, um, insulin is the hormone in the body that's responsible for um, keeping your blood sugar levels sort of um, low or, or even. And when your cells don't respond to the insulin, it's called insulin resistance. And that's the first stage of type two diabetes. And this is a hugely on the rise um, in, the, in this country with insulin resistance and type two diabetes as well. Um, exercise also helps reduce joint pain, back pain and general stiffness. And this is something that a lot of people don't want to exercise because they've got back pain. But actually, if you strengthened and mobilized those muscles or the spine a bit more, then that can help. I do a lot of classes that are mobility flow. I've got the posture project, which is a, a postural class that starts on it's one class per month that starts tomorrow. Um, and when we have back pain, we're quite likely to sort of shy away. But actually doing certain exercises can help with with that as well. Um, exercise also reduces your stress hormone production and it boosts your mood increases your energy levels which people think how can it increase your using up energy but it does give you that that um when you do feel tired and lethargic actually doing a workout can make can energize a wee bit more and it can help you to focus um and improve your concentration level so these are all positive uh, these are all aspects of exercise that can help through this period in life so all of these things here you might be able to tick off yep got weight gain would like to change the shape of my body what definitely won't strengthen my bones 
I feel a bit stressed. I do get anxiety and low moods or mood swings. I don't sleep very well. I've got menopausal symptoms. I don't want to get heart disease, stroke, blood pressure, high cholesterol, or insulin resistance. I do have back pain or stiffness. If you can relate to some of them, then simply adding some movement into your into your day. And it could be five minutes, start off at five minutes, increase to 10 minutes. It could be three times a week, two times a week. It could be every day. So these are all just the, the um, positives that can come out from your exercise. And I did actually want to put in the negatives of exercising, but I couldn't think of any. <laughs> Obviously, I'm biased, but I couldn't really. I thought, well, the negatives, like you never really think, oh, I feel terrible after doing that workout or after doing those stretches. I wish I hadn't done that. So I couldn't really think of any negatives. But if you disagree, then please, please, uh, please tell me. <laughs> um, so how do we adapt your workout regime? So considering all the physical, physiological and cognitive changes we experience, how can we adapt our workout? So this is if anyone is currently working out how can we do this? Luckily, there are crossovers, as I said. So by doing weights, you help the physical, the physiological and the um, the cognitive side of things. Some types of exercise will be beneficial for all of the aspects or multiple aspects of that as well. So this is some, um, some things that you can start to add. So adding weights, body weight or resistance bands sort of strength work, because that helps the metabolism, build your overall strength, build your bone density, improve your posture, boosts your feel-good hormones, balances your blood sugar levels and delivers um, nutrition, sorry, <clears throat> to the thyroid. So because you're boosting that circulation, your thyroid gland needs all your vitamins and minerals. It needs everything. So you need to have quite a diverse diet to include all the vitamins and minerals that the body needs because your thyroid to function properly needs all of that. And that's a totally different um, workshop. Um, but I will I will do that one one day. Um, and the better your circulation is, the more these nutrients will get delivered to your thyroid gland as well. And uh, by exercising, by moving your body, you increase that circulation as well. So add. So that's first of all, start by adding weights, body weight or resistance band work to do some strength. Adding more recovery sessions. So let your body restore so that you reduce your risk of injury, you reduce um, lethargy, you improve your sleep, improve your posture, reduce anxiety, reduce stress, and again, improve your thyroid function because your thyroid also needs that res restore in, in time just to rest because your thyroid is the, the, the gland that is very much linked to your metabolism. So if your thyroid is low functioning, you're going to have a lower metabolism. If your thyroid is high functioning, you're going to have a high um, a high um, metabolism we do want it to be in between we don't want the high thyroid and we don't want the low thyroid we want to try to get it get it in that that sort of in between and the recovery sessions can help with that as well um so for example if you're doing if you work out five days a week start by increasing and maybe doing one full restore session and then maybe saying well after that workout i'm going to really focus on doing a really good stretch session after it or I'm going to do 10 or 15 minute stretch before bed one night as well as doing a full Pilates or trigger point Pilates or or stretch class or something as well so adding your weights adding your recovery session try to make sure when you're exercising your heart rate is increasing and you're building up a bit of a sweat as well stretching before bedtime and this could be five minutes it can be jammies on sitting at the end of your bed doing some neck stretches some mobility lie back bring your knee in towards your chest on my youtube channel you'll find bedtime chill and relax sessions that range from 30 minutes to an hour and um you just you could do first 10 minutes of that and it can really affect your um quality of sleep as well and generally being active throughout the day avoiding long periods of sitting so if you are working at home and I think a lot of it's shown that everybody that I know is just like, yeah, I just sit for, for ages. I sit for hours. So trying to make sure that you are moving your body as much as you can through the day. Think about your steps, trying to get your steps up. Um, every 30, 40 minutes, you're getting up, walking to the other side of the room, going down the stairs to fill out your water bottle, doing a little lap of the garden, just walking around the block, things like that. So just general activity has a huge impact on your day. And I would say... And I've said this to the women in my in all my groups that I would much rather that um, my women focused on increasing their activity level than doing five workouts a week. I think if you're only managing to get like two, three, four thousand steps in a day, I would focus on increasing that before I would focus on 
doing that workout because actually what you're going to then do is sit most of the day do your workout at night for the hour or whatever but then you're going to sit for the rest of the night as well whereas if you get into that habit that your body's moving more then it has a much more um, positive effect so thinking about the activity not the workout think about the activity so trying to increase that activity um in your day as much as possible before you, st you, you start the exercise I think that has a, a, a much more positive effect on, on the whole body as well. So adding your weights, your body weight, your resistance work, adding your recovery sessions, and I can't stress how important they are. Um, make sure you're increasing your heart rate and your sweating when you're working out, um, stretching before bedtime, and just be generally active. So these are things that you could put on a wee list and you could say weights, stretch, um, sweat, and steps. And you could tick off, I've done my weights today. Yep, I've done my stretch today. I've done that today. And I've been active. I've got like X amount, 6,000, 7,000, 8,000 steps or whatever. And it's just, you can have that as a visual and you can write that out each day and it can help, help to keep you focused. Has anyone got any questions? Nobody's typed any, but has anyone got anything that they want to ask about? I know it's it's quite a lot to take in, but hopefully it's it's been helpful so far. If anyone's got any questions, just unmute and, and ask. Mm, my tea's now gone cold. <laughs> so that was all of our, um, that was all the, the sort of hormonal change. Now, this is what we're talking about, exercising around your menstrual cycle now. So there are certain points in your menstrual cycle when you can um, rescue, <laughs> reduce your PMS, they should all be capital symptoms, by altering the stress uh, that you put on your body so when you are going through certain times in your menstrual cycle when you're doing certain type of exercise or workouts it can be adding extra stress and these can make your PMS symptoms a wee bit worse as well so I'm trying not to make it be like a biology lesson in high school but phases of your menstrual cycle shown in the little diagram here so you've got basically um, day one to day five ish where is day one is the first day of your period and then we go round to about day 12 to day 16 is where you have your ovulation phase as well so you can use your menstrual cycle to your advantage because because of the hormone changes it can have an impact on your mood as we know it can affect your appetite as we know you can be more creative at times and if you really if you do what i tell you to later you'll notice this your concentration levels, sleeping patterns can change, which people probably know, sleeping patterns and quality, your energy levels. Now, I am sure that the majority of us know that. Your self-esteem can be higher at certain times of the month. Your libido can certainly be certain um, at set, higher at certain times of the month. And a lot more things that, that are affecting as well. So understanding what's going on when can be a really, really good thing, a really good beneficial thing. Now, as I say, I wanted to go a lot deeper into this, but I just, I didn't because it would have been a complete other workshop. So I've, I've tried to just give you the basics and I'll maybe do this in a further, uh, uh, another full session. So first of all, track your cycle. Tracking your cycle is not all about um, figuring out when to conceive. This can really, really help you sort out some symptoms though. It's hugely important to be able to work with your cycle as opposed to you feeling like your cycle is working against you so you're like oh that time of the month it just makes me feel like this it makes me feel like that but then there's another on that flip side you'll be able to say ah but that's the time that i can do this and do that and do this and do that and that will help with my moods and my symptoms as well so when you track you will be able to figure out and this is different for everybody some people 28 days some people 25 days so this is very specific and this is why you need to try i can't say that day one to five is when you bleed because that, that's not that's not right, because that, that can be different for everybody. You can pinpoint common symptoms like that week leading up to your period, you're like, well, about two days before, I start to feel like this. My sleep changes. On day 12, I feel I get hot all the time. I'm really warm. I feel that that week leading up to that week of my period, I'm in pain. If you do have things like diastasis, abdominal separation, or pelvic organ prolapse, these can be a wee bit more symptomatic at these times as well. So your diastasis, you can feel your core's a wee bit weaker or maybe your pelvic floor feels a wee bit weaker at times like that as well. And these may all happen about the same time in your cycle. So you tracking will be able to pinpoint this and see. So I would say A4 sheets, day 
one, two, three, four, five, so all the way down. And then you just put your you just put your um your month. So May, June, July, August, September, figure out when your date. So start this on your next day one there and just note how you're feeling on the day. Now you can go as in depth in this, or you can you can literally put a word in it. Um yeah, so you can pinpoint common symptoms like your mood, sleep, body. I've done that bit, sorry. Um it can help you to be a wee bit kinder to yourself. And this is something that I personally am working on recently is sometimes you're just not going to tick off all those. Sometimes you're just not going to get it done. And I guarantee that if you go through your cycle tracker, you will say, do you know what? That week, I'm just not good for anything. So I'm not going to plan to conquer the world that week because <laughs> it ain't going to happen because I get overwhelmed. I get stressed easily. I can't sleep. And that again has a knock on effect. So you'll be able to say that few days, like that few days leading up to my period, I'm just like, oh my God, I'm useless. So you'll be able to figure that type of stuff out as well if you track and you can be a wee bit kinder to yourself. Also, if you have any issues that you want to go to your GP with, if you find that I think I've got this or I think I've got that, the first thing the GP is going to do is say to you, track your cycle for three months and then let me know if you see any consistencies there. If you go with that already, you're like, well, I have, this is it. This is the, this is how I'm feeling. And this is what I've pinpointed as well. So that takes that out of the equation. You've already done it. You go prepared basically as well. So if you ever think that you're going to go, well, you might not actually know that you're going to go. So the benefit is that if you do this anyway, and then all of a sudden you think, oh, well, that's a bit unusual. I'm bleeding out with my period or anything like that. Then and you think you'll be able to get to your GP sooner to be able to kind of um, figure out what the issue is there as well. So it's, it's very beneficial to do. And I literally can take, I literally do it every night before I go to my bed. And I just, it's like a couple of words I'll write. Sometimes I, work, I use it as an almost like a kind of journal. Some weeks I'll, I'll write a, a couple of sentences. Some weeks I'll just be writing, feeling shite or whatever. <laughs> so what type of things do you want to track? I'm not meaning that you have to um, sort of decide on all of this. You don't have to put energy levels high, low on a scale of one to five for all these. You don't need to do anything like that. Just these are the things you want to have in your mind. How are your energy levels? How's your sleep quality? Have you got any sex drive? Are you bloated? Do you feel hot? Is your body temperature raised? Are you getting pains and cramps in your pelvic area or maybe into your lower back area? Are you irritable? That's my first sign. I'm like, oh yeah, three days. In three days, that's me irritability off the scale for me um maybe you just want that time alone again that's very much something that i i like i just crave that time where so i've got um live with my husband and three kids so youngest is three oldest is six and i just crave that time i'm just like oh my god give me some time on my own um so that that i think for me is, is a symptom definitely as well your general appetite any digestive issues again like bloating but you might get constipation or diarrhea do you get headaches? Are you emotional at certain times? Do you crave backache, which I think I've said that already, uh, anxiety, low mood and stuff as well. So these are all the things that you might, I mean, who would go through this every month knowing that all these things could happen to you? Who would do it? Only a woman. Only a woman would do this. <laughs> so these are the type of things you want to think about. How do you track it? I'm, I'm just pen and paper, to be honest, but you can get these apps. And I'll be honest, I used the Flow app for a little while but I just couldn't be bothered. I'm not, I, I prefer just writing things down. The other ones, I just went onto my Apple app store and looked to see what there was. So I don't know if these are any good. I just thought I'll give you a couple of examples. I know a couple of people have recommended Clue and somebody um, had recommended Moody Month and I just remember liking the name of it and it always stuck um, as well. But I like to just use pen and paper and basically I have got uh, my month, it's like almost like a calendar. You could do it on an actual calendar as well. Um, summing up your day in between one and three words again sometimes i'll write out a sentence like oh such and such was really bugging me today or whatever but other times it's just feeling low um irritable and craving sweet stuff or something like that um and yeah the, just like that it can be something really really small it could be one word could be three it could be ten it just depends on you and there'll be times when you might want to elaborate on it as well so that would be how to track now, the phases that we go through, hold on, I've got a, hold on a wee second, oh, Balance, so a, a great app called Balance for tracking your period, and yes, I've heard about that one as well, actually, 
So balance is another one. Thanks for that one, Hazel. Um, let me see. Why is this not coming off now? Ah, more chat. Oh, this is what happens. Ah, go back, go back, go back. Hold on, I'll do this. Oh, sorry, guys. Mm, technical stuff. Technical, technical. It's not letting me get rid of that now. This is what happens. Right, let me see if I can stop that. Ah, there we go. Done. Okay, so the phases, I'm going to be very quick, I promise. Um, the fillet gear phase accounts from day one to the time that you ovulate, which is roughly between 12 to 16 days. Your estrogen levels tend to increase. You may, and on that day, kind of one to five, one to six, you'll feel a bit rubbish because that's obviously when you're bleeding, you're losing blood from your body. So obviously that's going to have an impact. But from about day six, your mood starts to improve, your confidence increases a wee bit. So from day one to six, focus on a more lighter form of exercise, like more restorative stuff. Then from day seven, let's increase the intensity and that will increase, that will coincide, sorry, with the increase in your energy levels. Your follicular phase can last anything from about five to eight days. Sometimes it's longer, sometimes it's shorter as well. So this is just a rough guide. But basically... Um, day one is the first day um, of your cycle starting and then from about day um, day seven start to increase intensity in your workout because that coincides with your energy levels and stuff as well. Ovulation phase is between day 12 to day 16. Your oestrogen levels start to lower and you might feel kind of some aches or pains in the lower abdomen when you're ovulating and your body temperature rises. This is where your kind of normal exercise <clears throat> pattern, that should be, sorry, <clears throat> and intensity should continue. So from day seven up to about day 16, then you're fine to just continue with what you normally do, okay? The luteal phase is a time between that ovulation and the start of your next period. So I'm not giving you a, a time scale of that because that can change for, for a lot of people. Your body prepares itself for pregnancy and this is what we call progesterone is that hormone. So pro means um, before, gest is like gestation for um, through pregnancy, your so many weeks gestation. And so that's your, your hormone um, prepares the body for gestation basically prepares yes prepares the body sorry for gestation and that's quite dominant at that point your um premenstrual syndrome symptoms may occur in that phase for about a week before you start to bleed so if you start to lighten up your exercise regime again at that time okay um when we oh let me see Am I still there? Can you still see my share? Is everyone still there? Are you still there? Hello? Yeah, I'm still here. Yeah, here. Oh, yes. Right, that's fine. I just, for some reason, I couldn't see me on it. So I thought, oh, I've maybe cut everybody off there. I had a wee moment. I thought I maybe cut everybody off. That's fine. Sorry, guys. Um, <laughs> so um, that to lighten up your exercise regime can help with those symptoms as well. So um, very quick summary. The week leading up to your period, and this is where tracking helps because you'll know where this is. The, lead week in, the, lead, the week leading up to your period and the week of, not full, the week of your period, that's like that two-week period there, your, you want your workout intensity to be a little bit lower so doing an extra restorative session or um just adding maybe lowering your intensity slightly as well can help and then use that day seven to do 21 roughly where you increase that intensity again and that's where you're going to make most of your gains so the two weeks you'd basically work at your harder intensity for two weeks and you work at a lower intensity for two weeks as well and you kind of cycle that round in your body will adapt and change to that and it's really beneficial mm -hmm. to do that as well. So your body will appreciate the rest and you may see some more gains instead of kind of just like pushing through all the time when you're feeling tired, you're like, oh, I'll just keep going or just keep going. When you are feeling tired and lethargic, that your body's telling you like, I'm tired. So, and it's like, oh, well, I am on, like I've got two days to my period start. So 
you're probably having to reduce that sort of um, intensity a little bit, which I think will be more more beneficial. So hopefully that makes sense. That week leading up to your period, the week of your period, a little bit lighter, and then those other two weeks you go back to doing what you're doing and increase your intensity a wee bit. Has anyone got any questions that you want to ask that you can think of? Oops. Mm. I'm trying to get here. Not letting me do that. Ah, oh, there we go. Uh, bum, bum, bum. I think Pam, I might watch it again and then see if there's any <laughs> questions I can think of. That's fine. No, nope, not at all. That's completely fine. Um, yeah, if you've got anything don't hesitate to ask don't hesitate to, to get in touch with me so the other... Pam, can i ask a wee quick question of course yeah see if you're on the contraceptive pill yep. i take it you don't have these kind of fluctuations do you just have kind of high estrogen the whole time um yes well your 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 hormones are all sort of regulated with that as such but you might still get some symptoms so still sort of tracking your symptoms as such could um, could have a positive effect on that as well. So if you know that that when you if you say if you take the pill for the three weeks and you come off it for a week, you might still have the some symptoms just leading up to it. So still altering how you're doing your workouts can make can have an effect on that as well. Does that make sense? Oops. Yeah. Thanks. Sam. Yeah. That's all right. Anything else? Anybody else? <laughs> Hello, Phoebe. <laughs> I knew I was going to get interrupted. Right, give me a wee second, Phoebs. Um, so the next session I'm going to do with you is a uh, eating for hormones because I found it very difficult to try to, um, to kind of keep it separate. To be honest, so I'm going to do an eating for hormones one as well. That one will probably be next month at some point, as well. Um, and then I've got Better Body Balance starting, um, in June. So that's just a program. It's all about women's health, and these are all the things that I'm going to cover in that program. So. Um, nutrition basics and habits, mindset goals and focus, exercise and self-care, stress and stress management, sleep, stress and fat loss, midsection weight gain, uh, your thyroid and energy levels. I'm getting body brushed here. Phoebe's brushing me. Bone density, <laughs> heart disease, female cancers and pelvic floor, gut health, finding that balance. Everyone says that, that balance, yeah. Um, alcohol, smoking and lifestyle and environmental factors. So these are all things that's going to basically be one thing pair per week um, that I'm going to run through that as well. I'll give you information out on that Hello. soon. <laughs> Down you come, please. I'll Hello. send out some information on that soon. Hello. All righty. Hello. So, has anyone got any... <laughs> Bebe, could you go and sit over there for me a wee second, please? Has anyone got any other questions that you want to check? Was that helpful at all? Was it helpful? Let me know. Just wait. Yes, Pam, very helpful. Yeah. Very yeah, good, good. I'm yeah. glad. Going to very second. Um, that's good. I'm glad. I'm glad it was helpful. Then I know it's it's a lot to to kind of take in, um, but that that's just me. I try to I try, I try to put in as much information as I can for you, so that it all kind of makes sense as well. Phoebe, could you go and sit over there for me, please? Somebody gets very giddy before bedtime. Sorry. <laughs> um, but yeah, glad. Hopefully that's hopefully that's been helpful for you, and. Yeah. Um, if you've got any other questions that you want to ask, then please don't hesitate to drop me a wee email, and um, we'll just let we'll just let Phoebe go. Go on, come on, mummy's working. Out you go. Um, if you do have any questions that you want to check, then please don't hesitate to let me know. If you watch it, if you watch it again, um, sorry about the interruption at the end there. Never. Never can manage all this working from home. That's what it does. <laughs> um, so thank you. Thank you very much, ladies. I will email out this recording and uh, I'll, I'll probably do it tomorrow, to be honest. Um, I'll email it out tomorrow and then you can, if you've got anything else that you want to ask or check, just just let me know. The, would it be helpful to have the slides emailed out? Would it be so that you maybe don't have to go through the the full presentation again would that be helpful do you want the slides as well yeah that would be good pam that'd be good okay 
Right, I'll put them into PDF and then you can kind of scroll if through. If it's them. easier for you, if it's easy for you to do. Yeah, yeah, as I just, I'll just um, save them as a PDF and I, I can email them out. I've got admin time tomorrow anyway, so I can do that. I can do that with no bother. Um, and yeah, it means that you'll be able to just kind of scroll through and see, uh, and you can see, oh, what was it she said about that again? She talks a lot, so uh, yeah, hopefully that will help. But that's fine. Anything at all you want to check, don't hesitate to drop me a wee message. And um, if you want to join any classes or in like the Lift Lean program or anything, then just drop me a wee message. I've got my next group for that starting at the end of the month. So you can you can get in touch if you want any more info on that as well. Yes, I would definitely recommend that. Yes, I know you would. <laughs> <laughs> I know lots of you would. And I've not paid anybody to say that, I promise. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, ladies. I'll let you go for the night. Thank you. Get to your bed nice. nice and early. Right. See you bye later. Bye. All right. Bye -bye. Good night. Thanks, bye.